We are recording now, so let's pray. Father, as we come together again and as we begin our Sunday morning with a time in your word, may you open the way for us to take it to heart, to understand it fully, and that our lives may be truly changed because of what you revealed to us. Bless our time of study in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in uh, Galatians chapter 3. There are some handouts there. Uh, since I wasn't here last week, uh, just to refresh memory a little bit. Good morning. Uh, we are moving, this is, we're going to chapter 12, just a few verses back. For all who are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to do them. The one who is justified by the law, no, now know that no one is justified by the, by the law before God is evident for the righteous will live by faith. So we spent a whole lot of time, the last time we were together, talking about the passage that the righteous will live by faith, reference to Abraham. And the distinction and the difference between uh, what it means to be part of a covenant of faith, where we're dependent upon the grace of God, and the covenant of the law, where it is dependent upon our flesh, our ability to keep the law. And Paul's point all the way through here is that God has always had His plan, is always His intent, that everyone would be saved through faith, not through the law. So we get to verse 12. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, the person who performs them will live by them. So the previous passage, now know that no one is justified by the law before God is evident for the righteous one will live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, the person who performs them will live by them. So what's Paul's point? If you turn from Christ and choose to live by the law, you must keep the law perfectly. Remember, that's the whole discussion in Galatians. The whole challenge is that you have Jews and Gentiles who have become Christians in, in, in the region of Galatia. It's a region, not a city. And they are now being taught you need to go back and become good Jews in order to be saved. It's no different than what we see in our society today. People say, well, mess Messianic Judaism is the way to go. You're supposed to be a Messianic Jew. You're supposed to convert to all the Jewish rituals and laws and follow everything that the Jews do and believe in Jesus in order to be saved. And that is stands in stark contrast and contradiction to what Paul is talking about in Galatians. There's a clean break. Okay, from all the requirements of the law versus faith. Okay, so to fail to keep the law perfectly is to be found unworthy of standing before God. So if you're going to live by the law, then keep the law. But do it perfectly because if you break even one law, you are declared unworthy and rejected by God. And my note, we've not even taken into account original sin. What is original sin? The corrupted nature that we have inherited. You do not have to teach a child to be bad. You have to teach a child to be good as they grow because bad comes naturally. And that's, that's, the, that's the result of the fall. Why do children get sick and die? Because of original sin. It's not that God had done any horrendous thing. But the original perfection that God created was lost in the fall, and by our very nature, we are corrupted. Because I'm a sinful person, I will do sinful things. Original sin, I'm a sinful person. Actual sins, I do sinful things. Because I'm prompted and motivated to do that, because I'm no longer holy, I'm no longer perfect. So our corrupted nature. For Moses writes of the righteousness that is based on the law, that a person who performs them will live by them. So... If it were possible for someone to live perfectly and never sin, they could be saved by the law. Who's the only one who ever did it? Jesus. The only one. Okay? There's no one else that is able to do it. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Um, Christ lived the perfect life that we could not live and then die the death that we owed. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The heart of the gospel. The law brings judgment 
the judgment of God upon all who are sinful. That's all of us. Christ bore the curse for us when He was crucified for us on the tree. Now this is one of my favorite passages. To me, this is one of the clearest proclamations of, of what the Gospel is. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so we might become the righteousness of God through Him. It's called the great exchange. His perfect holy life that He lived, keeping the law perfectly, is attributed to us. And our sinful life, where we failed God, is put upon Him. So we trade places, as it were. He becomes us on the cross, so we can become Him. And as us on the cross, with all our sin, He is no longer holy, no longer worthy, no longer acceptable, and He is judged, and He is punished, He is condemned, and He is damned, and He dies. It's not fair. It's never been fair. Never been. Uh, Mr. Rush, right now you just said Christ lived the perfect life that we couldn't. Right. What was after that? And he died the death that, that we deserve. That we deserve. Because we're unholy because we can't live a perfect life. That's what this passage is about. It's called the passage of the great exchange. He goes to the cross and everything we are, he becomes. So everything he is, we can have. We trade places as it were. Okay. And so his righteousness is given to us, our sinfulness he takes to himself. As he, so when he becomes sinner, we're made righteous. That's what the cross is about. So, uh, Galatians, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. We were strangers and aliens. Hebrews uses that terminology. We weren't the children of God. We're sinners. We're separated from him, destined for destruction destined for hell. What does He do? He redeems us. He pays. To redeem is to pay the price. So He pays the price so we can be adopted into God's family. And, and when you are adopted into family, all the rights and privileges of one born in the family become yours. We deserve hell, but we've been adopted into God's family. Now we are children of God. And, that's the, and the theme of adoption is seen all through Scripture, but especially in Paul's epistles. That we become the children of God because God chooses us to be His. Just like a parent chooses to adopt a child, God chooses us to be His. Romans, long passage. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation or payment in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because God's merciful restraint, because in God's merciful restraint, He let the sins previously committed go unpunished. For the demonstration for the demonstration, that is, of His righteousness at the present time. So He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What does that mean? It means the moment Adam and Eve sinned, God should have zapped them. The moment Cain killed Abel, He should have been zapped. The moment, you know, go on down the line. The moment sin was present, God should have acted. God is holy. Sin must be punished. But God... What does, he, what does he say? In, because in God's merciful restraint, He let the sins previously committed go unpunished. He did not give us what we deserved when we deserved it. Instead, He gave us Jesus. So, what I've used as an illustration before is an understanding of the Day of Atonement. And, and that's just one way you can think about it. But the idea is that you know, Aaron was to take the blood of the sacrifice one time a year into the Holy of Holies and pour it upon the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. God is ready to give judgment. God, we deserve it. Humanity deserves it. And it is impending. And Aaron takes the blood and pours it, and God relents. He holds back His judgment. And it builds and it builds and it builds until the next day of atonement, and God's ready to pounce and the blood is poured and God relents. In restraint, He holds back the judgment the world deserves. And so you get to... Why? Because of His mercy. And so you get to the Garden of Gethsemane. And God's impending judgment is there. This judgment that is heaped up and mounded and accumulated since Adam and Eve in the Garden that's all ready to be judged. And Jesus says, let this cup pass from me. What, why a cup? Because it's going to be poured out. And on the cross, there is no relenting. The judgment of all humanity is emptied upon Him. It's brimming full. And He suffers 
for everything that has happened since the garden to that moment and everything from that moment to the end of time, he took all that the wrath that God should have already given, but God in his restraint because of his mercy held it back. He did not give humanity what we deserve. Instead, he was merciful and waited from antiquity till Christ came to give us grace. And from that point forward, to give all those who would believe grace instead of the judgment we deserve. That make sense? You look dumbfounded. <laughs> yeah. We deserve judgment. Right. God would still be God, holy up on His throne, if He sent all of us to hell right now. Mm -hmm. It's what we deserve. But God, in His mercy, chooses to give us Jesus so that through faith we can have forgiveness instead of judgment. Yes. Knowing we were going to do it again. Yeah. That doesn't change his heart, though. Uh, speak for yourself. I am. <laughs> first, first, Here's first another one. He was delivered over because of our wrongdoings and was raised because of our justification. Uh, well, actually, there's supposed to be a break there. Okay? He was delivered over because of our wrongdoings was raised because of our justification. There should be a space, two different verses. Um, you know, Christ was judged because of us. He had done nothing wrong. Our sins sent him to the cross. Uh, Romans 8, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, uh, and as an offering for sin, to condemn sin in the flesh. You know, why couldn't the law work? Because of the weakness of our flesh. Because we are sinful human beings, we will sin, we can't keep the law. We can't do it perfectly. We just don't get it. So the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. I really messed that up. I should have three passages there. <laughs> what, what does the Spirit do? Brings us to faith so we live in a different kind of relationship with God through faith, not based on the works of the law but on faith in Christ. And Titus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. So we're redeemed from every lawless deed, every sin, and to purify for himself his own possession. We become his, and therefore, belonging to God, knowing we're forgiven, good works flow naturally from a heart of gratitude. So, a lot of passages in this section. Ever knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. For me, the silver and gold thing makes sense. Uh, but verse 20, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. That means that this was always God's plan. And that's something that, as a human being, finite as we are, we're trying to understand the mind of God. God, being God, knowing everything, says, okay, I'm going to create the world, bring creation into existence. I'm going to create the man and the woman in my image. I'm going to give them dominion over all the world. Somewhere in that mix, one of the angels that I create is going to rebel and fall and lead the angels into rebellion. And they're going to tempt the people I create, my children. They're going to sin. And I'm going to spend the next 6,000 years, whatever it is, uh, trying to bring about a remedy for their sin. So before I ever create, Jesus, you're going to do this for me? You know, and Jesus said, yep, man, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, um, I'll go and be the Savior. And then after you do that, people are going to spit on you and, re and reject you. And throughout the rest of the history of the world, they're going to mock you, as in the Olympics. Uh, and, and, and a few will be saved. Now, let's start creation. And, I, and I, from my mindset, if I'm God, I say, bad idea. Let's move on to plan B. Okay? But, but that's the thing about God. That when God sees something, it is a reality for him. Even though it doesn't exist yet, he's God. So when he saw you, all those eons of time beyond creation, as a lost sinful human being, he loved you and wanted you 
And because He loved you and wanted you, He said, let there be light. And that's why I say the first act of grace on God's part was creation. Those first words He spoke were grace. Because He created us knowing He would have to die on the cross to save us. And He made that choice willingly. It was the grace of God that moved into creation. Because even before we existed, He loved us and wanted us. That's the grace of God. So, uh, And He Himself brought our sins in His own body up upon the cross so we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By His wounds you have been you were, you were healed. So, uh, again, Peter talking about He takes our sins so that we can be different now. We can be healed, forgiven, and live for Him. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all time, the just for the unjust, so He might bring us to God, have been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Um, what's the problem with this passage in, in Christian in Christendom today? How is this passage not understood? Christ suffered for sins once for all time. According to the theology of some churches, Christ suffers every moment of every day. Yeah. He's still being whipped. He's still being thorned. He's still being you know, nailed. He's still being damned. He's still being judged. He's still shedding blood. He's still suffering today. At and this technically moment. Technically, that's true. Huh? And technically, that's true. No. Well. No. See, that's what Roman Catholicism is, is mm -hmm. disintegrated into. Every time they celebrate the Mass, Jesus is suffering for sin. So every time the priest institutes the Lord's Supper, Jesus is crying out in agony, still suffering for sin. But, but Peter says, once for all time. It was all done there. All done. And that's, again, a God thing we can't comprehend. How can He take every sin of every person who has ever lived or ever will live to himself in one moment in time, and then in that moment in time, take an eternity of judgment into himself and vanquish the judgment of God by the bloody shed in six hours on the cross. It's a God thing. We can't fully comprehend it. It's kind of like the creation of the world or of the earth. Yeah. And it's beyond our ability to fully comprehend. We know it's true because he says it, but can we, as finite human beings, fully understand and comprehend it. No. And yet it's true. He did it. And so His suffering is done. The resurrection is victory. He conquered the enemy. Okay. 14. And we're going to spend a lot of time in 14. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham would come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So we got to talk about Abraham, we got to talk about the Gentiles, we got to talk about the Spirit. And we spend like several screens on this. Through Christ, the blessings of the covenant which was made with Abraham would be extended to the Gentiles through faith in Him. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham had this very unique relationship with God. He was called the friend of God. He believed God, and based on faith, he had this relationship. You have Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, then the 12 sons, then 430 years, then the Exodus, and then Moses, before the law ever comes. There is no law. There is no understanding of right and wrong. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. Okay? And societal standards change from village to village, and culture to culture, and ethnic group to ethnic group. I mean, everybody had their own rules. There was no standard. There was no standard law. It wasn't. It didn't exist. It wasn't. Hadn't been revealed. Okay. Uh, and so, it's a long time from this relationship of Abraham through faith to the giving of the law. And what is what is Paul's point? That God chose Abraham so that all the world could have this kind of relationship with him. This one that came before the law. Good morning. Okay. Um, and so the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. Angel's message to Mary, what's going to happen now is going to bless the world. Everyone. How then are they to call on him who they have, of whom, in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? 
How are they to hear and let without a preacher? But how are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. What is the message? It's a message of good news to the world. To everyone. Not just some. I saw a video clip last night of Billy Graham back in his prime. And I don't know where he was. It was one of his evangelistic meetings. I don't know where he was. But he... he <laughs> and, you know, back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, it was a different world, right? And he said... Christianity is not a religion of white people. Oh, yeah. no? It's not a religion of black people. It's not a religion of brown people, the Asians. It's a religion for white people and for black people and for the brown people. It's a religion of the world. It's for everyone. And that was right in the middle of racism and, the, and all the stuff going on. You know, you got it right. Jesus came for everyone. That if you confess with the mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? What does Paul say is required? That you believe, confess your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you believe Jesus is Lord but you don't believe He was risen from the dead, are you saved? According to Paul, no. Those two things. Believe in Him, and in a sense, believe in what He's done. The full message of what he's done. Because the resurrection comes as the victory over all, after all the suffering and everything. So when the churches of the day say the resurrection was a myth and a fable and it didn't happen, they're absolutely heretical and anyone who believes that is not saved, according to Paul. Okay? For with, the heart, one, with, for with the, the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, why did Jesus suffer and die and rise to be Lord of all? To save Jew and Gentile alike. Everyone. Okay? And I know people don't like me saying it. But they're not two tracks of salvation for two different ethnic groups. There's one way of salvation, faith in Jesus. Got a problem with that? Take it up with Paul. Who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Again, we're not he, he's nullified. Any idea of different methods or ways of salvation for different people. The Lord has bared His holy arm in the sight of all the nations so that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. You know, back at the turn in the 1800s, uh, in the late 1800s, when the Great Camp Revivals were going on, there was a sense of urgency to save the world. Even into the 1900s. You know who the bravest people in the world were? Who the what? The bravest people in the world, the bravest people the world has ever known. The missionaries from America who packed their belongings in wooden coffins and put them on a ship and went to Africa and other places. They took their coffin with them because they knew they would die and have a box to be shipped home in. And they went, taking their coffins with them because the urgency of the gospel was more important than their physical life. We don't have that sense of urgency anymore. We don't have that sense of understanding that there are people in this world who need Jesus and it's our job, our privilege, to take Jesus to them. So, Lord is... Um, I've got to do that one. <laughs> it will come about after this that I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions. So, all those verses, for those who believe the Gospel who have had faith in Jesus as Savior, God sent forth His Holy Spirit. I hope to this passage, we've got to talk about Jesus, we've got to talk about Abraham, we've got to talk about the Spirit. And we're going to break this down in a minute. So we're talking about Abraham. The blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles. That's the part of the passage. 
What is the blessing of Abraham which God <clears throat> desires to give to the Gentiles? Who are the Gentiles? Everyone that's not Jew. Everyone else, okay? What was unique about Abraham's relationship with God? God established a covenant with Abraham, and he lived in a relationship with God before the law was given him at Sinai. Now, I added a slide in here. I'm going to come up just a minute after this one. God intended to establish the same, this same covenant with all people through faith in Jesus. A relationship established through faith, not based on the law. Now, Jeremiah, mm -hmm. one of the key passages in the Old Testament. Very important passage. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their heart, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God's going to do something in the heart. Now, I put this slide in here. It's not on your sheet, okay? What is the purpose of the law? The law was not given in order to save humanity. The law can't save. The law was given to show people how to live in a relationship with God. Now, Abraham had a relationship of faith. You heard me talk about Exodus 20, 24 numerous times. <clears throat> now, it is different than Genesis you know, 12, where you've got Abraham and faith. It's different. The law is a binding covenant because, you know, but it was established a covenant through the blood. Remember, the relationships have established. So Moses goes up the mountain, Exodus 24, all the you know, words of what it meant to be God's people were given to him. Deuteronomy, what do you want to guess? We aren't told exactly. Because now it speaks it to the people. They said, all the Lord has said we will do. They, all night long, Moses is writing it down. They're building the, the altars. They're sacrificing animals. They're gathering the blood. Moses reads it to the people. Second witness. People say, all the Lord has said we will do and we will be faithful. They add to it. He sprinkles the blood. The covenant is established. Now with a covenant, there's a relationship. So those representing all of Israel, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, which included Joshua and Caleb, by the way, go up on the mountain and they see God and they eat and they drink. They have a covenant in you. That covenant is established. It is after that, 31, from 24 to 31, this is when he gives the Ten Commandments. The tablets of stone that Moses breaks on the cat are given in chapter 31. The law wasn't even there. It wasn't there when the covenant was established on the mountain. What happens between 24 and 31? This is how we're going to live together. You're going to build this tent. And in this tent, there's going to be an Ark of the Covenant with a mercy seat because I'm going to be present with you in mercy. And there's going to be a table of showbread because I'm going to provide for you as your God. There's going to be an altar of incense because I'm going to hear your prayers as they ascend. There's going to be the, the, the candlestick because I'm going to light your way. And there's going to be this big altar of sacrifice because I'm going to accept your sacrifices when you do sin. You're going to have priests that are intermediaries. And they're going to be dressed a certain way to reflect my glory. And all this is given, and then he gives him the tablets of stone. Here's how we're going to live together in this new relationship. And as those who live in this relationship with me, here's how I want you to live. Ten commandments. Love God, love one another. That's the fulfillment of it, right? Commandments about our relationship with God. Commandments about each other. Here's how we live in this relationship. Love me and love each other. That's it. Moses comes down the mountain, comes down the mountain and what's there? The golden calf. <laughs> and he throws the tablets of stone down and breaks them, grinds up the golden calf, make, puts it in the water, makes them drink it. And he judges a large portion of the people that die at that moment. Okay? But notice the law is given to reflect how to live in this relationship, it was never given to save them. The relationship was established in the blood. The law was given to say, here's how you live in relation to God. Has that changed? We are in a covenant through blood, and the law shows us how to live in this relationship. Love God. 
Don't have any other idols. You know, um, worship God. Honor authority. Be faithful to your spouse. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't covet. All these things are how we live in relation to each other and God. Nothing's changed. They just come out of a 400 year, 430 years of slavery relationship with pagan or you know over 2,000 gods in Egypt. Yeah. So they just come out of that, and I, I'm not sure, but I don't think those guys acted anything like the like the commandments. They just did whatever felt good. Yeah. And, they and so so. These people lived amongst that. Right. And if you if you live there, then then after or in a few generation after generation after generation. It becomes they're, natural. They're decline. All they had were oral had. traditions handed down about Abraham and Abraham's God. They had those oral traditions, nothing was written down. So yes, it's very easy. But I mean I mean but the flip side of that is God had delivered them in a tremendous way with the plagues had saved them through the Red Sea, had brought them to the mountain. They've seen God, the burning fire on the mountain. They've seen all this stuff, and yet they're so quickly willing to turn away to another guy because it took Moses 40 days on the mountain. 40 days, he comes down the mountain on the 41st day, and there's a golden calf. Okay. I'm not trying to justify what... No, I'm saying... The, I mean, being, there had to be a, something because they had not had any rules. Mm-hmm. Previously, so so when the commandments came, I mean they, they had to have a guideline because because they had lost all. Of them. They lost everything. Yeah, it was whatever any society deemed was best for itself is what they did. The law set out this is what God wants. The law was there, and of course Jeremiah says God's going to write that in our heart. You know we're you know we're going to instinctively know. You ask any person out in the world who's honest, who's honest. They say, yeah, I know there's something bigger than me. It's instinctive. We know we're not the top of the heap, the top of the mountain. There's something more than us out there, but we deny it. It's like, uh, who was a scientist? The, the, I forgot. I, I reused an illustration. He said, he, he, he actually wrote, I know the principles of evolution are not feasible. It's not real. It didn't happen. But the only alternative is to believe in a creator. And because I do not want to believe in a creator, I choose to believe in evolution, which I know is wrong. We choose to deny what we know to be true and hold on to the lie because we like that more than the idea of, of being subject to God. Now that's sinful humanity. That's a sinful heart that, that chooses to deny what it knows to be true and believe a lie because I'm more comfortable with the lie than I am with it. That's that's humanity. So, so this my point here. The covenant with Abraham was a covenant of faith. Here, the covenant, the relationship, the covenant is established with the blood, and the law was given to show how to live in this relationship. That's what is going on in Exodus. But remember, it is different. <laughs> The law on Mount Sinai is given because it was given to the people and they said, yes, we want this. Twice. They said, yes, we want this. So they're committing to it because we get a little bit later on, we're going to talk about the difference between the, 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 the covenant with Abraham and the covenant at Sinai. There is accountability at Sinai. There was not accountability with Abraham. We're going to talk about that when we get to it. Okay? Isaiah, for I'll pour out on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground, I'll pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. How much time we got? Okay. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. You are to stay in the city until you are clothed with powerful and high. References to the Spirit coming. Okay? Even there at in Luke 24, before Jesus sins, the Spirit has not come. And that's one of the age-old questions of dealing with what was the Spirit's role in the Old Testament and how has it changed in the New Testament? Old, you know, New Testament age, you want to call it that, okay? Because there is a difference. But I'm not going to tell you I understand it all. But this he said with reference to the Spirit whom those who believed in Him were to receive. Future tense. Don't have it now. They were to receive 
For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, remember, the Spirit was hovering over the waters. The Spirit inspired the prophets to write their books, to preach their messages. Okay, the Spirit was there, but differently. Therefore, since He has been exalted at the right hand of God and has received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, uh, He has poured out this which you both see and hear. The Spirit's coming was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made. Who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Notice, in our hearts. All the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had also been poured out of the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter responded, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? For by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. We were all made to drink of one Spirit. Okay? In Him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of the promise, who is the, a first installment of our inheritance with regard to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Now highlight it, who is the first installment. Back here, uh, uh, poor Don Genoza. Previous one? The spirit, okay. Uh, gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. What's a pledge? The first of something more to come, right? And here, who is the first installment of our inheritance? The first of something more to come. So, what's the difference in regard to the Spirit between the Old Testament and the New Testament? That's the question. Because something has changed. And I'm not going to tell you I have the definitive answer. Because I think we're, it's, a, it's one of those God things. Okay? Uh, moreover, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll remove the heart of stone and from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. My understanding, it seems that the major shift which took place is found in God's spirit abiding with those who believed in the Old Testament and the spirit dwelling in the believers of the New Testament. There seems to be that distinguish, you know, distinction. Whether I'm absolutely correct on that or not, I can't tell you. Because we're not given a whole lot about the Spirit in the Old Testament. We know He's there, but we're not given any details. We're given all kinds of details in the New Testament. But what, is, what does He mean by a pledge and the first installment? That's easy. God lives with us until we live with Him. That's the easy part. Because what is it that God desires? For us to abide in His presence forever. And until we are in the presence of God, God humbles Himself to come and dwell with us. God with us until we're with Him. That part I think I understand right. That He's the first installment, the pledge of something greater. Because what's the greater? I'm going to be in the presence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Right now, I have the Spirit with me, and dwelling with me. But that's only the first step. Something greater is coming because I'm going to get to be, I'm going to get to look upon the face of the Father. I'm going to get to feel the hug of the Savior. I'm going to get to, to dwell in the glory of God. That's, so the, the Spirit, His presence in my heart, is God's promise to me that something greater is coming. As well as having Him present to live with me and guide me and use me here. But this seems to be the distinction. The with versus in. The Spirit of God was in the Old Testament. He was working. But there seems to be this sense of the Old Testament that God's going to do something greater in regard to the Spirit in the future. And then Pentecost happens. And yet God's got something greater to come <laughs> than this in the future for us. And that's a good thing. Any questions on that? But you read paragraph there, Senate. Mm hmm is the question that goes along with that is how were people saved? No, it's what is the difference between the Spirit's Spirit 
working in people's lives in the Old Testament versus Spirit working in people's lives today. Before the cross, after the cross. You know, He was there with them in the Old Testament, but not in dwelling inside of them. In the New Testament, He's dwelling inside. You know, well, faith's at work in both instances. Yeah, faith would be at work. Abraham had faith. He believed God. But the abiding presence of the Spirit is what we're talking about. Did, did everybody have the Spirit in the Old Testament or just certain individuals? Or the Spirit with them? Well, in helping the, the, the head of the leaders or, or, or all of them? I mean, wherever there's faith, the Spirit has to be at work. We know that. There's no faith without the Spirit. That's a, that's a very foundational theological thing. Sinful man doesn't choose God. God chooses us. Uh, the Spirit leading and guiding uh, is seen throughout the Old Testament many different ways. I mean, you know, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day and that was with Israel for 40 years wandering through the wilderness. That was God's presence. That was that the Father, the Son, or the Spirit. <laughs> I mean, it was, yes. <laughs> you know, so God was present. God was there with the prophets. God anointed the kings. I mean, so there was a lot of activity and presence of the Spirit of God. But there seems to be, and again, it's, it's, it's a, we're, we're delving into unknown areas, you know, treading in deep water. There seems to be this distinction between the Spirit being with the people who believed versus indwelling. As we'll hear today in today's message, you know, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Who is in you? You are not your own. You are bought, bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. The actual physical indwelling, where God the Spirit comes and lives inside of us. That is a New Testament day of Pentecost thing. All right, that's probably a good place to stop. <laughs> As if you're going to delve into something much more. Any, any other thoughts? Is this is deep deep? Yeah. this is deep theology. This is deep theology. This is deep stuff. Okay? But then that's why I chose Galatians after Romans. These two books both are dealing with the same kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, Paul is laying it out there. And, and it's, it's, it's deep stuff. So, let's pray and we'll head to worship. Father, we ask your blessings upon the next hour. May you prepare the hearts of your people to receive a very challenging word. And may we not only be receptive, but may our hearts be open to hear the truth you reveal, and that our lives may truly be transformed and changed, that we might be the people you desire for us to be. Bless those who serve and all who receive. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs>